So now I want to spend a few minutes to talk about the process of fine mapping causal loci, which is basically the process of uh, taking a SNP which you've statistically associated with a given complex trait or disease, and now you want to actually figure out which specific variant in that locus is the one truly driving your phenotype. And so one of the problems that we haven't really talked about yet is one of fine mapping. And so suppose that we identify a variant that we think is associated with a complex trait or disease, and we're fairly sure that it's not due to some kind of confounding factor. The problem is that even once we find an association, typically those SNPs may not be and are unlikely to be the so-called causal SNP. And what that means is that basically uh, due to linkage disequilibrium, uh, SNPs are not inherited independently. Uh, and so what that means is that typically a set of variants will be inherited um, by children. And so when you're testing for an association of a single SNP against a phenotype, you're not actually really testing uh, that variation of that single SNP against a phenotype individually. You're actually testing a whole set of SNPs, uh, basically the set of SNPs that tend to be co-inherited um, together uh, basically you're testing an entire set of SNPs instead of just one single SNP. And so the reason that's a problem is that even once you find a genetic signal, you still have to do the heavy lifting to basically perform what's called fine mapping, which refers to the procedure of identifying the precise variant or set of variants that are responsible for driving that signal that you see in your association study. And so what I'm showing here is basically uh, one specific uh, locus and its results from a GWAS study. And basically what you can see is that what I've labeled as landmark SNP is the SNP that was actually tested in the association study. And what I'm listing in the top part of the graph is basically a bunch of SNPs in that uh, general locus, as well as the, uh, the negative log 10 p-value of those SNPs in the original study. And so you can basically see that even though the landmark SNP gets a you know, relatively high p-value, negative log 10 p-value, there's a bunch of other SNPs in the same region that also get kind of an equally high signal. And so the job of fine mapping is to basically identify which of these, if any of these that we've seen here, is the real one. And so the heat map on the bottom uh, is basically a pairwise correlation map between pairs of SNPs at that locus. And just like the high C map, uh, basically you see blocks on the diagonal. And what those blocks tend to correlate well with are basically haplotypes. <clears throat> and so a block of SNPs that are highly correlated across a population and therefore likely to be co-inherited, uh, in this case, uh, will tend to form a red block. And so you can basically see, you can basically visualize the problem of fine mapping here, which is that uh, even though your GWAS study identified this landmark SNP uh, that's correlated with your phenotype, um, there's a whole bunch of other SNPs that are highly correlated with it. And so you can't, in practice, you can't really know which one is the real one. And so fine mapping tends to be easier for some types of variants than others. And so if you're lucky and you and your GWAS study identifies a SNP inside a coding region of a gene. And suppose that you get really lucky and that variant suggests a non-synonymous mutation in that, uh, in that corresponding protein. Then there exists a large number of software packages. For example, a popular one is called PolyFen2, which basically try to predict the pathogenicity of different coding variants. And so what that means is that uh, you know, if you are lucky and you know the 3D structure of the protein that a variant is causing a non-synonymous mutation in, then oftentimes based on looking to see where that residue sits on the protein, so is it on the like surface? Are you just changing one hydrophilic residue for another? Or are you doing something really drastic like changing a hydrophobic residue in the core of a protein into something hydrophilic? Um, based on ideas like that, 
uh, software such as Polyphon 2 will predict for you, okay, like this mutation might be deleterious, this one is not. And so it can help you sort through a bunch of local variants in that region to say, okay, well, if my p-value says this association is strong, that may likely mean that uh, this variant probably has a big effect on the protein. So which variant in this region uh, you know, is predicted to have a big effect on the protein structure? So unfortunately, the vast majority of variants, and so by vast majority, I mean that GWAS studies of human complex traits and diseases uh, so far have more or less found that 90 somewhere between like 90 and 92 percent of all GWAS variants identified as being associated with traits uh, tend to sit in non-coding regions in the genome away from protein coding variants. So that's a huge problem because you know by and large the non-coding region of the genome is much more difficult to uh, characterize and it's much poorly much more poorly understood in general than the coding regions. And so how people typically do fine mapping in non-coding regions is that they typically look at the locus and they look at different variants uh, around the around the SNP that was pulled down by our GWAS study. And they basically do like a what you would call like an integrative analysis. So you basically look at, for example, uh, chromatin accessibility, accessibility assays. And you might try to identify, okay, of all the variants that could possibly be the causal variant in a given region, which ones are overlapping open chromatin regions? Because maybe those are more likely to be the real one. Because if you know if you have a variant that has a big effect and it's in the non-coding region of the genome, if the open regions are where all the regulatory activity is happening, then maybe it's more likely that the causal variant is one of the variants that is sitting in an open region. And similarly, like as shown in this diagram, you might look at ChIP-seq peaks from different transcription factors in that region. Uh, and you might hypothesize that, well, the causal variant, if it's in a non-coding region and if it's likely to hit like an enhancer, then you know maybe we should check uh, different transcription factors to see whether one of the potential causal variants is overlapping a binding site of a TF that we know. Um, and basically you can kind of go through this process and basically look at, yeah, basically chip seek data from different TFs. You might look at chromatin accessibility. Um, and later on, uh, after the transcriptal mix lecture, you'll realize that you can also look at, uh, even like look at enhancer RNAs or like enhancers which tend to be transcribed and see whether there's any potential causal variants overlapping regions that are transcribed as enhancer RNAs. Uh, here in the lower part of the diagram, uh, another common approach is to uh, look at multiple sequence alignments of related genomes. And so here again, the idea is that, um, as we mentioned in the alignment lecture, sequences that tend to be conserved across time, across evolution, tend to be you know, harboring functional elements. And so you might prioritize some SNPs that sit in highly conserved regions over uh, SNPs that might sit in non-conserved regions. Uh, if you're looking at, say, a tissue like heart or, uh, say, skin cells, whereas if you're looking at like the brain, for example, maybe you wouldn't care so much about conservation because you think that uh, human, like the brain has evolved in humans much more quickly than other organisms. Uh, but generally here, the idea is that fine mapping is the hard part of GWAS studies. Um, and because most of the variants associated with different traits and diseases in humans anyways are non-coding regions of the genome, then all of those assays that we looked at for in the epigenomics lecture and uh, TF lectures and high c um, all of those would be basically be used here to, to try to identify variants that are in kind of interesting regions of the genome where something is happening, whether that's physical interactions through high c or regulatory or epigenomic, basically using all of that kind of data to try to figure out what is, you know, which variants are most likely to be functional in this region and therefore maybe a causal variant. And so another point I want to try to make is that GWAS studies by and large are, uh, are typically underpowered. 
And another more positive way of saying that is that the number of genetic associations you tend to find with GMO studies tends to increase with the number of individuals you have in your study. And so here's just an illustration of different, different real uh, GWAS studies of schizophrenia. And you can see that as the number of cases in the study increased, the number of loci they detected also increased. And so lots of GWAS studies are, are pretty underpowered. And so generally speaking, when you're looking at association studies, try to look for ones in which the number of individuals in the studies is large, because generally speaking, they're better powered to identify associations.